Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of um, The Fifth Elephant by Terry Pratchett. So I've been rereading this via audiobook as my uh, reread for Rereadathon for the month of June. And uh, yeah, Pratchett's one of my favourite authors. I can't actually remember what the prompt was. But uh, this is one of the City Watch books. I don't have the blurb in front of me, so I'm just going to jump in and start going through my notes. The very first thing I wanted to share is uh, the introduction to this book, the first couple of pages. They say the world is flat and supported on the back of four elephants, who themselves stand on the back of a giant turtle. They say that the elephants, being such huge beasts, have bones of rock and iron and nerves of gold for better conductivity over long distances. They say that the fifth elephant came screaming and trumpeting through the atmosphere of the young world all those years ago and landed hard enough to split continents and raise mountains. No one actually saw it land, which raised the interesting philosophical question. When millions of tons of angry elephant come spinning through the sky and there is no one to hear it, does it, philosophically speaking, make a noise? And if there was no one to see it hit, did it actually hit? In other words, wasn't it just a story for children to explain away some interesting natural occurrences? As for the dwarves, whose legend it is, and who mine a lot deeper than other people, they say that there is a grain of truth to it. It's very cool. And then, yeah, we, uh, in a little bit we cut to Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Cole on. I believe he gets promoted to Captain Cole on briefly in this as well, and uh, predictably doesn't take it very well. Uh, but yeah, they're using like uh, like flags to signal to each other, and so we have a uh, Cole on the signalling, and it looked like a man with two stiff arms playing table tennis. Uh, there's also a brawl and uh, between the dwarves because there's a lot of politics going on. We actually get that the Vimes and his entourage go to Überwald. Uh, but there's a fight between a bunch of dwarves, and uh, Vimes knows that it's over because the number of suspicious innocent bystanders. And uh, the narrative says uh, it was turning out to be one of those days, the sort you got every day. And then back at the City Watch office, uh, Detritus wanders in to, to speak to Vimes. And Vimes calls him in. He goes, you know, like, oh, hi, Detritus, come in. And Detritus, uh, he's surprised by this. Uh, it always amazed Detritus that Vimes knew that he was at the door. Vimes never told him that the walls and the floors creaked as he walked along the corridor. There's also a clerk in this called Inigo Skimmer. Uh, he always reminded me of like Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. I don't, I don't know if he's supposed to or not. It's just a name, I think. Uh, and he's one of those interesting characters where not all is as it seems. And actually rereading it, I remember the first few times I didn't much like him because he's not meant to be likable, you know. But uh, rereading it now, I think he's a fantastic character. We have uh, Vimes remembering a saying from his childhood. Too poor to paint, too proud to whitewash. And Vimes himself has some of this interesting sort of class struggle, really, where, because he's married a duchess, and, um, you know, there's even a point when uh, Vetinari's about to send him off to be a diplomat, he's about to send him off to Uberwald, and Vetinari's like, oh, I couldn't send the, the captain of the city watch there, and Vimes is like, oh, thank goodness. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm going to send the Duke of Ankh-Morpork, which is Vimes' new rank, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that's quite clever as well. Uh, someone killed Sonki, Sonki is the condom manufacturer. Uh, Vimes says that Sonki was a national hero because the housing crisis would be way worse without him. Uh, he'd fell into his own vat of uh, liquid rubber and Vimes asked what he was trying to dip into it. So we get this kind of murder mystery thing happening as well. It's kind of cool, you get this like political thriller in this comic fantasy setting, but with a murder mystery background as well. And Vimes is trying to solve this mystery while on the road and that's only really even made pass possible through uh, the new, in new invention of the clax. And uh, Vetinari, the patrician, his clerk saying to him, do you think it's a good idea to send Vimes? He's not like a classic dip diplomat. And the patrician says, Vimes and Uberwald will be more amusing than an amorous armadillo in a bowling alley. Think about that one for a moment. So yeah, that's where I'm at so far. So uh, we get this quote here. Uh, a marriage is made up of two people prepared to swear that only the other one snores. I wouldn't know, I've not, I've not been married. I thought it was quite a, a good little character note here as well. So Angua, Sergeant Angua, she's a werewolf and uh, she's traveling and she's stolen some chickens to eat and she left some money behind. And uh, when Gaspo, the wonder dog, he's a talking dog, he's helping Carrot, Captain Carrot to track her down. And he asks her why she left money. And he says, because wolves don't, which I think is a nice point. Um, we have this quote about Vimes. Vimes is grinning at, uh, uh, despite being in like a confrontation with some people and it, and it says, uh, when you grin like that, it means someone's playing silly buggers and you've just thrown a six. I just love Pratchett's way of describing people. So he said some of the people in the square looked like they treasured their lack of a sense of humour. These like really serious dwarf types. And, um, and then Carrot, while he's trying to track Angua down, he goes into one house looking for some food that they can have, but there's nothing to take. 
and so he just leaves money and that's like to the dog's disgust the, the dog's like why would you do that especially because the family had said just take anything just don't kill us but Vi uh, but, Ca but carrot's a nice guy you know and uh let me get back to this character um oh what's his name the one who reminds me of inigo montoya um no his name's totally gone but anyway uh Vimes gave him the orange test, so he threw an orange, and people either react or flinch, and this guy just assessed it as not a threat and just ignored it. Which tells, tells Vimes that he's a certain type of person. So Gaspode, the dog, Gaspode isn't sure of his own ancestry, and he, he says there was some terrier, and a touch of spaniel, and probably someone's leg, and an awful lot of mongrel. Which again, I think tells you the kind of dog that uh, Gaspode is. It's, it's impressive that Pratchett manages to get so much characterization on an animal, you know? And then uh, we get the difference between Uberwald and Ankh-Morpork. So Uberwald is lawless. Ankh-Morpork is kind of lawless. It has many laws, it's just that people don't obey them, so it's different. And we get this great line, um, Vimes says to uh, uh, Flint, I think, uh, Constable Flint, says, uh, shut up, you're a free troll, that's an order. And uh, Sir Samuel, uh, he's asked how he knows something, and he says, uh, by the pricking of my thumbs, I've got very odd thumbs when it comes to pricking. And I like that as well, because that's a Shakespeare reference. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. But also, uh, Agatha Christie used it as a, a novel title. And uh, Anger of the Werewolves talking about Captain Carrot, and uh, they say, uh, Carrot's so unthinkingly nice, and sooner or later a girl can have too much nice. And he, he apologises for it, and she says, that's kind of the point, like, don't apologise for it. Um... And then they meet an Igor, an Igor, and uh, they're like known for working on themselves and performing operations and stuff. And Sybil asks if he had a terrible accident, an accident and Igor says, uh, I did spill tea down my shirt this morning, very kind of you to notice. Whereas obviously she means like, he looks like he's had an accident. All right, uh, I'm going freehand for this little bit, but uh, a few more notes I've got here. Uh, Sybil is such a badass, so uh, she sings a dwarfish opera and almost becomes an honorary dwarf for it and basically saves the day. It's just something she learned at finishing school as you do. And then uh, Albert, Albrecht Albrechtson, the low dwarf, he uh, understands more porky and he just chooses not to pollute the air by speaking it. So, um, so Vimes can talk to him in more porky and, and then he'll just respond with like Dah, clack. on that note it was interesting to hear the narrator speak Pratchett's dwarfish as well and then finally one at one note at the end the watch finally gets their Igor so uh, the next watch book will be fun because I like the Igors as characters so yeah overall as you can tell I really enjoyed this reread I gave it a five out of five which actually was what I gave it before it's um, one of my favorite Discworld books just by the virtue of it being a city watch book all of the watch books are good this one's probably one of the better ones still but I mean, if you're going to start, you might as well start from the first watch book. But the good news is, if you've never read a Discworld book before, just start with the watch books and read those. So there we have it. That's what I thought of The Fifth Elephant by Terry Pratchett. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book if you read it in the comments. Hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.